Welcome to History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and share this episode with a fellow history lover. And now, on to tonight's episode. Kerrville, Texas, April 1859. A group of settlers congregate in the early morning hours near the outskirts of this small hill country town heavily populated by German immigrants and settlers new to the area. A prominent local resident, 54-year-old Roland Nichols, has gone missing. Born in Franklin County, Tennessee in 1805, Nichols had briefly settled in Arkansas before making his way with his wife and children to Texas in 1856. He has not been seen by friends or neighbors since the previous morning, when he ventured out on what was meant to be a short tenured and otherwise routine turkey hunt. In these oak-strewn rolling hills, intermittently cut from west to east by a series of cool water rivers, the land is bountiful and ripe for hunting, fishing, and farming. For many of the settlers, these lands lying west of San Antonio and Austin are nearly unbelievable in their idyllic potential and providential bounty. But, as is so often the case in the Old West, the idea of a scenic homestead ensconced in a beautiful meadow is one that is indeed too good to be true. Though the American settlers are new to the area, it has long been a source of contention between its native inhabitants. Most recently, it was the Apache who had called this area home. But in the preceding centuries, this area of Texas had been ground zero from one of the most horrific wars ever fought on American soil, in which the Comanche had sought to all but outright exterminate the Apache. The few Spanish missions that were able to solidify any sort of presence north of San Antonio had been besieged by Apache survivors of Comanche raiding to provide them with protection from tormentors. For decades, Apache men, women, and children were subject to brutal, unbiased violence at the hands of Comanche raiders eager to both take over this valuable territory and to drive their enemies from it. The Spanish, too, were largely unable and unwilling to weather the ferocity of the incessant Comanche raiding. After a series of relatively short-lived attempts at expansion northward, they eventually retreated southwards themselves rather than continue to endure the violence. By this time in the 1850s, the settlers of most towns in this area are largely composed of German immigrants and settlers like Roland Nichols and his family transplants from states largely in the southeast, such as Tennessee, Alabama, and Arkansas. Though they are new to the area, the problems they face are the same as those of their predecessors. For decades now, full moons have been dreaded all over the Texas frontier, as these were the nights when Comanches most often seemed to conduct their raids. Most settlers who have inhabited this area for more than a few months have already been inundated with tales of wanton Comanche brutality that were unlike anything most of them had ever heard of. Roland Nichols had, however, remained steadfast in his desire to stake his claim in the area. He had, in fact, been elected county commissioner and had a reputation about Kerrville as a trustworthy man and an upstanding citizen. Though the danger of Comanche rage is certainly a very real and very pertinent threat, it is not uncommon for local men to venture out into the countryside in search of game, fowl, fish, or errant livestock. As Nichols had ventured outside his door this very morning, the surrounding countryside had seemed so placid and inviting that he deemed it an absolutely impassable opportunity for turkey hunting. Though he was certainly aware of the dangers that could be held in the countryside, perhaps even more so than most given his seat as county commissioner, he had deemed the venture safe. The site he intended to hunt was little over a mile away. He was amply armed to defend himself and there had been no reports of raiding in the area in the last few weeks. Nichols had taken his double-barrel shotgun, a small supply pouch, and his hunting knife, and set off early that morning, bidding his wife and children a cheery farewell, assuming that he would see them again in a matter of hours. But by dusk, there was still no sign of him. His wife had become alarmed and notified their neighbors. A search party of local men had quickly been assembled, but not before nightfall. Thus, the group has been forced to wait until now, as their collective silence speaks volumes to their hopes of actually finding their friend and neighbor alive. The men check their weapons now, for heading out on the trail of Nichols, their eyes alternating scanning the ground before them for tracks and the surrounding countryside for any sign of the Comanche. Their senses alight with adrenaline, the men find Nichols' trail, heading in the exact direction he had told his wife he was going. For roughly a mile, 
nearly the entirety of the journey to Nichols' preferred hunting site at the mouth of the ravine, the men are able to discern Nichols' boot-heeled tracks with little issue. Then, just before reaching the mouth of the ravine, they come across several sets of softer, rounder imprints of Comanche moccasins. How many exactly, they cannot be sure, but it is evident from the tracks that they have managed to stay just behind Nichols and out of his direct line of sight. Suddenly, the boot-heeled tracks now turn a drastically different direction, now headed due east and away from the mouth of the ravine. The round impressions indicated the footsteps of his pursuers now follow suit, with the two sets of tracks drawing nearer and nearer as they head towards a nearby tree. As they approach the tree, the party is met with a sight that is, at first, inexplicable. From a distance, it seems as though some wild animal has marked the tree by stripping its bark off in a nearly perfect ring and circling the tree about five feet off the ground. However, try as they might, none of them are able to recall any sort of animal in the area that would be capable of leaving such a mark at such a height. It is only as they follow the tracks of Nichols and his pursuers that they are able to discern, at least to some extent, what exactly has transpired. The tracks, both Nichols and his pursuers, encircled the tree several times, in some cases doubling back on each other. Evidently, as Nichols had circled the tree in an effort to evade his pursuers, he had inadvertently gripped the tree trunk so tightly that the bark had been peeled off as he ran. The search party, now with their nerves on end, scanned the surrounding area, quickly finding the lifeless body of Roland Nichols, lying only yards away from the tree in the grass with one arrow in his chest and another arrow as well as a gunshot wound in his abdomen. Eyes still scanning the countryside around them, the men survey the scene in an effort to ascertain the order of events and Nichols' unfortunate demise. It is thought that the arrow which struck him in the chest hit him first. Then, as evidenced by the soft, circular knee prints in the ground yards away, Nichols had fallen to his knees, in either a state of shock or in an effort to shoulder and fire his weapon. The bullet and arrow lodged in his abdomen had both initially struck his left arm, before penetrating his left side and wounds scarcely an inch apart. In a final effort to evade his pursuers, Nichols had again risen from his knees and ran as far as he could before succumbing to his wounds. Nearby, half buried in the dirt, is Nichols' shotgun, still fully loaded. Nichols' body is taken by his friends and cohorts back to the town of Kerrville, where he is laid to rest beneath an oak tree on his property. Today, it is known as Nichols Cemetery, still located just outside of Kerrville, Texas. However, while the incidents of another life lost in the struggle for the much vied for territory of Texas is certainly a tragedy, the death of Roland Nichols soon raises several questions. It is unrecorded whether the body was found scalped or unmutilated apart from injuries, but a lack of any such degradation would not be in keeping with typical Comanche practices. Also to be considered was the loaded weapon left buried in the dirt. Again, typically, Comanche warriors would be loath to leave behind such an item of value and prestige. Though no formal legal allegations are ever brought forth, it is whispered amongst several townspeople in Kerrville that something seems amiss in the death story of Roland Nichols. Theories begin to circulate that perhaps a group of locals had an issue with Nichols as commissioner, or wished to kill him in an effort to necessitate his widow portioning out his roughly 1,700-acre tract. Even the realistic possibility of this being the case is demonstrative of the multidimensional nature of the dangers of life on the Texas frontier. In a land devoid of governance and law enforcement, the threats to one's life were not simply relegated to individuals of different races, cultures, or backgrounds. Just as the ruthless nature of frontier expansion dictated the countless atrocities wrought upon the Apache by the southward sweeping Comanche, there are countless instances in Texas history in which landowners were threatened, harassed, and even outright murdered by any number of outlaw bandits who terrorized the Texas settlements for decades. Whether Roland Nichols' macabre death came at the hands of conspiring fellow citizens or indignant Comanche raiders will never be known. However, his grave still lies there today, underneath the old oak tree that he so loved in life. But the tales of brutal killings on the Texas frontier, not to mention the countless conflicts between the encroaching settlers and the indigenous peoples, are too numerous to cover here in one episode. For tonight, there are other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, share this episode with a friend, 
and become a subscriber. Also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes, as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking on the join button or click the link in the description below to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.